there are so many people asking big questions, questions like beyond, beyond like your job and your kids and your money and things like that. People are asking spiritual questions. I think for me, the reason why I, I love spiritual conversations are, well, because I feel like you're getting to the heart of the matter of a person, the core of a person. We can have superficial conversations all day long, but when you're asking about something transcendent and something mysterious, you kind of hear people's longings as well and their dreams and their desires and you hear their troubles and their fears. And I think we're more authentically human when we start asking spiritual things. The times when spiritual conversations go, <laughs> go really badly is when, I think when maybe one person feels the need to impose their ideas on somebody else, and they almost try and have an answer for every question, neatly packaged, tidily put, with a few platitudes here and there, and don't recognize um, maybe the question behind the question someone's asking. I think the best way to have a conversation with someone on a spiritual matter is to listen first, is to hear what they're saying, hear what they're feeling, if we're not certain about what they mean, to ask questions about what they're saying, um, to be open to engage and to allow ourselves to be unresolved. So I think the best way is listening, talking, laughing, making it, making it as ordinary as you possibly can. Well, good morning, Living Water. It is a great day to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Finally, it's not so humid outside. I got woke up this morning and I was very excited that I didn't burst out into sweat the first thing I walked out of house. So, amen to that. The Lord has given us great weather to worship the Lord this morning. We have a couple of announcements, uh, the first of which is in regards to Synod. If you recall, about a month, a little over a month ago, I went to Synod, which is the national gathering of the Christian Reformed Church, and we made some uh, significant decisions in regards to the Christian Reform denomination moving forward. As such, we're going to be having a time to talk about what those decisions mean on Tuesday the 26th. That'll be taking place at 7 p.m. here at the Sheldon campus. So if you would like to hear more about the decisions that were made or how it affects us as a denomination or a classes or a church, join us on Tuesday the 26th, which is this next Tuesday, at 7 p.m. here in Sheldon. There will be a time of information as well as a time of questions. I encourage you all to please come and join us. Next quick one is I will be out August 1st through August 4th. I'm going to be at a conference in Chicago. I will be here for all the Sundays. That's not a problem. But if you're looking for me the week of the 1st through the 4th, I will be out in Chicago. So if you need to communicate with me, I will try and answer my email as best as possible while I am over on the south side of Chicago. Our last one we always want to remember is our offering. There are many ways that you can, go to, that you can give. You can go to forallwhothirst.churchcenter.com forward slash giving or text your amount to 84321 and follow the prompts. And as always, offering baskets for physical gifts will be passed during the first song or you can mail them in to either campus. I believe that's all the announcements we have for this morning. Let's open up this time with a word of prayer. Bow your heads if you would with me. Father God, we come before you today with hearts thankful for the rest we get to have in you. Father, as many of us walk throughout our weeks, it can become very easy to be stressed, to become tired, to become overwhelmed. And today, Father, is our day of rest where we get to enter into your house. We get to praise your name. We get to hear your word. We get to be part of a family of Jesus Christ. We get to be part of one another and part of you. And so, Father, this morning, as we rest in you, we also want to praise your name through the songs, through the word, through the proclamation of our hearts. And so, Father, this morning, as we do that, as we both rest and praise we ask that we would do this well, not only for us so that we may be uplifted to face the week ahead, but we ask that we would do these things because you deserve them, Father. You deserve our thanks, our praise, and our honor. So, Father, as we rest, may we do that well for you 
this morning. This entire time is dedicated to you, Father. May we do it well for your glory. We praise this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning, Living Water. Um, your invitation to worship this morning comes from Psalm 8. Uh, this is kind of a special verse. As many of you guys know, I consider myself a baby Christian, didn't actively grow up in the church. But my husband and I have been attending Living Water for about six years now, right, Jesse? Six years, I think. Um, and in that, I've met a lot of people who have um, taught me so many things. And one of those is Dear Jeanette Swolgen taught me that King David was a man of music himself. And so this psalm is David's, and this is what it says. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels, but crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And with that, please rise and let us worship together this morning. When I look at your heavens, the moon and stars you set in motion, O oh God, I sing all glory and honor. What is man that you are mindful, the son of man that you would care for him? We sing all glory and honor, O oh Lord, our Lord. Oh, how awesome are your ways, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, may we see your kingdom come. Father, may your will be done in all the earth. In all the earth you gave dominion to your children, and you crowned them, O oh God. With glory and honor, so we'll sing of your name. Live our lives for your greatness, O oh God. And your glory and honor, O oh Lord, our Lord. Oh, how awesome are your ways. How majestic is your name in all the earth. of all names, creation cries out, and every knee bows, Jesus we crown you, oh Lord our Lord, oh Lord our Oh Lord, our Lord, may we see your kingdom come, Father, may your will be done in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, oh how awesome are your ways, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, may we see kingdom come, Father, may your will be done in all the earth. 
congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we once again have the privilege of witnessing God's church this morning continue to grow. And that is indeed a blessing because we get the privilege of welcoming into membership those who have been worshiping with us for some time. And we do that again this morning as this morning we welcome Leroy and Sandy Boone into the membership of Living Water Community Church. So at this time, Leroy, Sandy, if you would come forward. And as they're making their way up front, Leroy and Sandy have been worshiping with us for how long has it been now? Two years? Yeah, give or take, a year, two years. And I'm sure you've seen these guys around for quite some time. It has been a pleasure worshiping with them and getting to know them over the last couple of years. It is always a joy for a congregation to welcome new members into its fellowship. This morning, it is a privilege for us to welcome Sandy and Leroy Boone into membership of Living Water Community Church. This is our opportunity for you to not only enjoy all the benefits of full membership in this congregation, but it is our as a church opportunity to walk with you as you live out your faith. This morning, it is our joy to welcome you as we walk together for the benefit of the Lord's kingdom. And so, Sandy and Leroy, in your baptism, you were marked as members of Christ's church, and we believe that the Holy Spirit has led you to here at this time for your own good and the good of us as a congregation. So we, as a congregation, invite you now to affirm your faith in Christ and express your commitment to the life of this church and the mission God has given to us in this community so Sandy and Leroy, I ask you, do you affirm once again that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that the Bible is God's Word revealing Christ and His redemption, and that the teachings of this church reflect this revelation? Do you promise to join with us by sharing your gifts, walk with us in our worship and fellowship, and join with us in the mission God has given us in this world? Congregation of Jesus Christ, please rise in body or in spirit. People of living water, do you promise to receive Sandy and Leroy in love as your brother and sister in Christ, to support them with your fellowship and prayers, and recognizing their gifts, invite them into the life and mission of our congregation? Living water, what is your answer? Let's bow our heads in a time of prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for the gift of relationship. We thank you for the joy we receive at welcoming new brothers and sisters into the body of Christ, which is your church. And this morning, Father, we thank you for Sandy and for Leroy and for the work of your Holy Spirit that has brought them here to be part of the Living Water family. We ask, Father, that as we grow and develop deeper relationships with one another, that we as a church would support and encourage them, and they would support and encourage us as a church. And we grow together as a family this morning, Father, not just for our sake, but for your glory, so that we as a congregation may more fully continue to live out the mission that you have given us in this community. So this morning, Father, as we welcome the Boons, may we as a church seek to serve you first, honor you with our lives, and spread your kingdom in all we do. Thank you for this blessing of family today, Father, and we pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I think at this time it's only appropriate that we give a round of applause welcoming Leroy and Sandy. And we have a gift that will be given to you at a later date. I think Barb's got it in the back there for you. And as we welcome Leroy and Sandy, let's bring up the house lights. Let's all take a moment and do a walk around greeting them into our congregation as a family. Let's greet one another this morning. It's good having you guys.
If you guys want to return to your seats, we will continue worshiping. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name. Jesus, till every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus, your name is power, your name is healing, your name stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Shout Jesus from the mountains. And Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is People of God, you may be seated. Our scripture for this morning is going to come from the book of Luke. We're going to be reading specifically chapter 12, verses 30, excuse me, 32 through 34. So if you have your Bibles, would you open them with me to Luke 12, verses 32 through 34. Starting with verse 32 under the subheading, do not worry, it says this. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, 
where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's bow our heads before our Lord in a time of prayer this morning. Father God, once again we come before you, having already witnessed your Spirit at work, moving through the words of the songs that we have sung, moving through the music that has been played, moving through us as a body as we welcome people into your church. And Father, this morning we hope to witness your Spirit at work as we open the words of your Scripture. So Father, this morning as we open the words of your Scripture, as we dive into your Word, we ask that you would bless the mouth of the one who speaks on your Scripture and you would open all our hearts so we might hear your truth within it. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Friends in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we come together this morning to worship his name through the power of the Holy Spirit as we continue our series on big questions, looking at issues affecting the church and asking how we as Christians are supposed to interact with these issues based on what Scripture tells us. And over the last three weeks thus far, we first looked at how we as Christians are called to interact with and deal with sexual sin. Then we were told how we're supposed to interact with the issue of war. And then last week, we examined how we as Christ followers are told to interact with the whole sphere of politics. And this week, we turn towards a topic that, as Jesus himself said, has been and would always be with us, the issue of poverty. So today, we're going to be looking at poverty. But not just poverty worldwide, we're going to be looking specifically in our local context of Sheldon. And opening our scripture to find our answer to the question of what should our Christian response be to the poor and impoverished that are around us. And I think this is very important. It's a very important question. And be, it's important because this issue is facing not just the church universal, but all of us here today because we all feel the effects of the economy. We're all feeling four and a half dollar gas, right? It, thank you for the boo for that. We're all feeling the economic strain and we're all aware of the financial state surrounding us in our context and in these somewhat, I would argue, very difficult, financially stressful times, the poor among us, yes, even in this small town, the poor among us increase by quite a lot. For example, Josh, who's here today, and I talk about this frequently, Josh is kind of, whether most people know it or not, the eyes and ears of the impoverished in this town. He's doing walks to see where the homeless population are at. And the other day, Josh and I were talking, and we were brainstorming off the top of our heads, going through the list of homeless folks that we know in this town. And just the ones that Josh and I know of is anywhere between 8 or 10. That's just the ones that Josh and I know of. Those are people that are living in tents. Those are people that are living behind buildings. These are families who are living in vans. That's the ones Josh and I know of. That's us two know of 8 to 10 people in this town who are homeless right now. Right now. Now, and this estimate is the homeless population that we know of, but if we include those who are not homeless, but who are simply struggling to pay bills, the number would increase exponentially. And that's just here in Sheldon. And to some extent, we shouldn't be surprised by this. After all, as we said a few moments ago, Jesus himself told us that we would always have the poor with us. He says so in Matthew 26 as he's being anointed, pointing out to him being first and others second. He says, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. As he's being anointed, pointing out that he's the most important thing, he also points to the fact that the poor will always be around. So yes, being is that the poor will always be among us and be part of God's people. The first thing we have to do in regards to dealing with the 
the issue of poverty is admit that yes, even in our small community where it seems as if the issue of poverty is not present, the first thing we have to do is be aware that there are in fact poor and homeless people living near us and among us. That's just a fact. Now for some people, this fact may be a bit bothersome. Because we in Western society have a tendency to look down on the poor. And if I may be so bold, I think that's especially true around here where the prevailing theory to solve the poverty, quote, problem is for people to simply get a job. That is the overarching feeling. Well, if they would only get a job. That's how we solve the, quote, problem. We look down on the poor, and yet, if we look at Scripture, we see that the vast majority of passages relating to the poor, and there are many, many more than I will cite today, but the vast majority of passages relating to the poor paint a picture of God not only calling on His people to not just not look down on the poor, not to just have mercy on the poor, but in a way, God almost speaks very highly of the poor in contrast to our Western tendencies. He speaks very highly of the poor. We see that in verses like Proverbs 17.5. He who mocks the poor shows contempt for their Maker. Whoever gloats over disaster will not go unpunished. He who mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. And by the way, he also equates the poor to the rich and says, you guys are in this together. Lifting them up to value. Proverbs 22, verse 2. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is maker of them all. And as I said, these are just two of the many passages that talk about not only having grace with the poor, but telling God's people to value the poor among them. And all this leaves us with the first two solutions and actions that we can take and should take in regard to what is our Christian response to those struggling with poverty. The first action that we take is, first of all, admitting that they are here. And the second action we take is to not look down on those who are struggling but instead valuing them just as God does because society doesn't value the poverty, they value those in poverty, so we as a church instead must value them. We admit that they are here and we value those who are struggling with poverty. And now that we've admitted that the poor are with us and that at the same time committed to valuing them and their situations, what exactly is our response? What can we as Christians then do with the poor to help them out of the poverty those who are struggling find themselves in? What is our action? Well, as usual, there are two very different ideas, both found within Scripture. And the first action Christians can and probably should undertake to help solve the poverty problem comes in our Scripture for today in the Gospel of Luke, as we just read. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. That is one solution that Jesus states very clearly. And that command by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ doesn't really sit well with us a whole lot, does it? We don't so much like that, do we? Let's be honest. We don't so much like that. That's a little uncomfortable for us. Surely, Christ didn't mean for everybody to sell their possessions and give to the poor. Well, in fact, the early church thought that's exactly what Jesus meant. And they took the words of Jesus Christ literally and did that exact thing. And we find it in Acts 2. All the believers were together and had everything in common. 
Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to everyone as he had need. So yes, the early church took this directive by Jesus Christ very seriously. And though other scriptures don't tell God's children to go that far in providing by, for the poor, they still offer a stern directive that God's people must do something for them. For example, Leviticus 25, way back in the Old Testament, tells us this. If one of your countrymen becomes poor and is unable to support himself among you, you help him as you would an alien or a temporary resident so he can continue to live among you. Do not take interest of any kind from him, but fear your God so that your countrymen may continue to live among you. You must not let him money at interest or sell him food at a profit. In other words, take care of him, yes, but also don't make any money off of the poor. Care for them as best you know how. And in fact, the care for the poor was so important to the Lord that there were in fact entire Levitical laws made by God to ensure their care. Leviticus 19. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap the very edges of your field or gather the gleaning of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. This is God making a law that basically says, don't harvest your entire field because the poor need to eat also. This was a law that they had to follow. So yes, the Lord cares very deeply for the poor, but perhaps we're thinking to ourselves, well, yes, we are tasked with giving to the poor by Jesus, and yes, that's also what the Old Testament says, but what about the rest of the Bible? As if the Old Testament and the words of Christ weren't good enough. Well, James tells us in the New Testament that caring for the poor is not only something that we should do, but that the act of caring for those in poverty is actually one of the signs of belief in God. James tells us this. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And in fact, in 1 John 3, the author of the book actually seems to question the faith of those who don't care for those in poverty. As it says in verse 17, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? So, yes, one can and should very easily make the case that giving to the poor is not only the privilege of God's people, but it is also the responsibility of God's people. We are responsible to give to those who are struggling with poverty and in a time of need. That is our responsibility. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, but, that's all well and good. But what about that teaching that Jesus tells us if we give a man a fish, he eats for a day. But when we teach a man to fish, we fed him for a lifetime. What about that teaching by Jesus Christ? What about that? Surely this offsets our requirements to give to the poor. And you would be absolutely right if that proverb was found in the Bible. But guess what? It's not. Anywhere. That old proverb, give a man a fish, teach a man to fish, that's not in the Bible anywhere. In fact, the teach a man to fish proverb is actually an ancient Chinese proverb that is misattributed to Jesus. That's not scriptural. Nowhere in Scripture does it say this. But there are passages that point out the importance for those who are struggling to not just remain idle in their situation, but instead work towards bettering the situation in which they find themselves. For example, 2 Thessalonians 3, it tells us, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle. They are not busy. They are busybody. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread that they eat. It's telling people to work and effectively 
build for themselves a life. And there are many other passages and various other parables that speak to that exact same notion. And so, as per usual, as we've found with this series, we're left in a bit of a quandary here. Because yes, we understand that the poor are with us. And yes, we are called to value them rather than look down upon them. But the solution to the poverty issue and the actions we take as Christ followers have seemingly two different paths. Because on one hand, many passages in Scripture, including Jesus' own words, tell His followers to give to the poor to the point of some selling all their possessions in order to do so. But on the other hand, there are several more parables in Scriptures that seems to go the other way, challenging those who are struggling with self-reliance and putting the work on them. And so, here we are left with the question, what exactly do we do then? How do we help the poor? Are we really supposed to give everything we can? Or should we expect the poor to do the work? And while this seems to be two separate conclusions, that contradict each other, I believe the answer in regard to the question of what we as Christians are called to do with the poor can be found in the last verses of our Scripture that was chosen for today, as they state. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And this points out a very key aspect by answering not only what the children of God should do when it comes to poverty, but why we should interact with the poor. Which is we interact with the poor and give to them not only because we are commanded to do so, not only because they are important as fellow creatures and creations of the Lord, but we give to the poor because giving is an extension of the heart. As Scripture says, our treasures in heaven are more important than our earthly treasures. And while I will not say, yes, you need to sell all you have and give to the poor, that is a decision you have to make between yourself and the Lord with the work of the Holy Spirit. What I do know is this, by sharing our gifts with those in need, we are giving out of a godly desire to do so, not just an earthly desire to help. And because giving to the poor is a work of the heart, not just a work of the hands, it helps answer why we give to the poor. It gives us clarity on why we give to the poor, which is we give to them because we care about them this my friends is the entire crux of the matter especially in western society where the poor are seen as a quote unquote problem to be solved instead of people to be invested in and as you can probably tell there are very few things that grind my gears more than western society thinking that poor people are a problem I've been doing this for 15 years with the impoverished. It drives me absolutely nuts. Can you tell? I can't stand it when we consider the poor a problem to be solved, when instead we should be viewing them as a people to be interacted and invested in. And so, which by the way, that's not just my opinion, that is scriptural. And so, when we search around for our answers in Scripture in regards to the community around us, yes, even in Sheldon, the poor are with us. Yes, we are called to value them. Yes, we are called to give to them and help care for them. And yes, sometimes that means giving of both time and money and sometimes even supporting them walking with them as they work with those who are helping them to better the situation they are in. But we do all of this not out of some pure moral obligation, not out of a sense of being better than those who are struggling. We do all of this. We do all of these things because we, as children of God, are called to have a heart 
that is driven not for our own desires, but the desires of the Lord. Which means that if our hearts are turned towards God's will, we are tasked to care for those in our area who are impoverished, not seeing them as a problem, but a person we can relate to. And friends, I believe personally that out of this entire community, we as the children of God, we as living water, we are called now so more than ever to care for and love the poor among us. Sometimes giving of our time, sometimes our money, sometimes offering guidance, sometimes encouragement, sometimes even accountability when negative choices by that person are being made. And all of this points to the fact that if we wish to affect poverty in Sheldon, Iowa, we are called to be part of the lives of the poor in our community. Not because they are a problem, but because we care about them as a person. Now, I'm under no illusion that all of us here today and perhaps some watching online that we're all in a place to help others. In fact, there may be some here today who consider themselves poor. And for those of us here who may be poor ourselves, remember this and hear this. We, as a church, as living water, have committed and desire to walk with you. We desire to be blessed by you. We desire to value you. And it is my belief that if we as a church continue and strive to be a people of God who cares for one another, that though there will always be poor among us, we have the privilege of sharing a church home with those the Lord calls us to serve. Because, my friends, the poor are here in this community and they need people to love them just as Christ loved us to the point where He died on a cross for our sins. And so, my challenge is very simple. I call us to be those people. I challenge us to be that church. A church who loves and cares for the poor. Not because somehow it earns for us salvation, but because our hearts are for Christ and we desire to know the poor better. I challenge us to be a people willing to serve those who are hurting. And may we be so blessed in this endeavor that the poor among us in this town will in turn bless us with their presence and their stories among us. And so, I ask you this. In the midst of this challenge, and it's a tough one, I ask you this. What is the Spirit putting on your heart to say, Maybe I don't need to afford that right now. Maybe I need to give a little bit over here. Is He challenging you to drive past that guy on the side of the street? Or is He challenging you to pull up and say, can I take you to lunch? Evaluate in your hearts what the Lord is asking you to do because we as a church are uniquely placed to serve the poor in our area, and I believe we are called to do it well. So I challenge us to do exactly that. And in turn, may we be blessed by the poor among us in our body, worshiping with us. And may we be blessed with our stories. May we, my friends, be that church because when we do, we are truly following the Spirit in our hearts. And then we are truly following the guidance of Christ. We've done this in the past. I ask of you, let's serve the poor well in the future. Not because they're problems, but because they're God's people. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, it is so easy for us to talk about the poor, the impoverished, the widow, the orphan, the homeless, the folks who need 
love and care and help. It's so easy for us to talk about that on a Sunday, and then on Monday it disappears out of our mind. And Father, we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. People in this congregation are guilty of it. We're all guilty of driving past someone we know needs help. And yet at the same time, Father, that is exactly what You call us to do. You call us to give of our time, of our resources. You call us to give, a, to give of our expertise. You call us to give of our relationship to that person, Father, not because they are a charity, but because they are Your creation. And so, Father, it is our prayer that we as a church, as we are uniquely placed in this community to exactly do exactly that, it is our prayer that we as Your church could be the hand of Your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church, by caring for the poor and impoverished well, not seeing them as charity cases, but instead seeing them as people to be invested in so that whether we give of our money or of our time, whether that relationship ends well, whether it ends poorly, whether it ends at all, whatever it looks like, Father, may we be the hands and feet of Your Son, Jesus Christ, in this community to walk with the poor because they are Your children. May we value them, Father. May we walk with them. And may we invite them in to be so blessed that we may count them as part of Your body our church. May we serve the poor well, Father. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Restore my soul. Revive my heart. Renew my in heaven reveal to me what's in remains then leave
Christ, it has been a pleasure worshiping with you today. I encourage you to come back next week. We will be ending our big questions series with what I think is potentially one of the more divisive ones that we are going to be talking about, because next week we're going to be talking about abortion. And that silence as well as the, <gasps> is exactly what I expected. So yes, but we're going to be talking about abortion and what is our Christian response, not only to the latest controversy surrounding it, but what does the scripture say about such things as this? So please join us. It is my hope that even though we may be divided over this issue, that regardless of where we stand, we can all walk out of this series and next week and this week united in the name of Jesus Christ. So until we come back together again next week to talk about exactly that and worship in the name of our Lord and Savior, I want to encourage us to do two things. Number one, remember that the poor among us are not a problem. They're a people. They're not an issue. They're a person. As such, if you are among us and you are impoverished or you're struggling right now, feel free to call out, feel free to reach out to a care elder, a council member, myself. We'd love to hear your story and help out any way that we can. And if you're in a position to help out, Evaluate this week, what am I called to give up so that I may better serve the poor? Because they're not a problem, they're a people. To that end, until we see each other again, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything He has commanded us. And surely He is with us always to the very end of the age. Amen. Go in peace.